Yeah, I'll react to that, sure. All right, yeah, I'm choosing HP. HP Lovecraft. All right, this is HP. Uh, just for fun for me, I like to kind of pick a random historical figure and put him into the uh, video with us. And uh, we were actually born in the uh, same city, Providence, both Rhode Islanders. All right, let's get to the reaction. Go. What's up, guys? McJibbin here, back another reaction video. All right. We're doing the last part of the uh, Russian history series over on Epic History TV. If you're new to the channel, my name's Connor. Hello. I like to learn about history through YouTube recommendations. I'm out of breath just by going up the stairs. Um, and uh, love for you to join. Hit all the buttons. Uh, join the Discord, guys. A lot of fun. Everyone's nice. It's a good time. Uh, the more the merrier. Pull up a chair. Would love to have you. All right, let's get right into it. Russian Revolution. This is a great channel. Obviously, the original link, the top description below. The Discord will be right below that. If you're not ready to learn about history, just get the hell out of here. All right? Or just chill. It's, that's fine, too. All right, ready? No, I gotta get my coffee. And I'm gonna do the uh, technical check. Go. It's going. Good. Okay, one sec. Okay, sorry, go. I shall never agree to a representative form of government because I consider it harmful to the people whom God has entrusted to my care. Nicholas II, 1904. Hmm. In 1894, Nicholas II became ruler of a Russian empire that stretched from the Baltic to the Pacific. Inhabited by 126 million people from 194 ethnic groups. It was a country in which workers and peasants lived in poverty and hardship, while Russia's elite, its imperial family and aristocracy, lived lives of gilded luxury. There was a long history of struggle in Russia against the injustices of the system. And in 1905, a revolution forced the Tsar to allow the creation of a state Duma or National Assembly. Huh? The Hold Tsar. On. Sorry. And in 1905, a revolution forced the Tsar to allow the creation of a state Duma or National Assembly. But its power was limited, and the compromise pleased neither the Tsar nor the reformers. All right, so this is kind of recapping the end of last episode. In 1914, this divided empire was plunged into fresh crisis by world war. What a great beard and mustache, though. What is all this talk about the people's confidence? Let the people merit my confidence. This guy was, uh, he had a bit of an ego, huh? Nicholas II, 1916. World War I was a disaster for Tsarist Russia. At the front, the country suffered a series of devastating defeats. While at home, there were food shortages and economic chaos. The Tsar was held responsible for the crisis. After all, he was now the army's commander-in-chief, and he was standing in the way of government reform. His German-born wife, Empress Alexandra, was even thought to be supporting Germany. While the entire family was said to have fallen under the spell of a Siberian mystic... Did he wear eyeliner, or did, is he just that naturally creepy-looking? I... I... I Faith sorry. Healer fallen under the spell of a Siberian mystic and faith healer, Grigory Rasputin. In December 1916, Rasputin was murdered by Russian aristocrats, possibly with the help of British secret agents. Both groups determined to end his influence over the Tsar. But in the eyes of many, the damage had already been done. Oh, it was, so was that like Britain's attempt to 
you know, keep the, uh, because this is, you know, their cousin, right? This is uh, King George third, uh, fourth, maybe, uh, cousin, trying to, like, prevent anything worse from happening to them. Obviously, they don't succeed in that, but... Aristocrats, possibly with the help of British secret agents. If I'm wrong there, let me know. ...determined to end his influence over the Tsar. But in the eyes of many, the damage had already been done. Situation serious. There's anarchy in the capital, government paralyzed, chaotic shootings, uh, shooting in the streets. Mikhail Rodzienko, chairman of the state Duma. You guys can read, obviously. On the 23rd of February, 1917, thousands of women took to the streets of the Russian capital, Petrograd, to mark International Women's Day and protest over bread shortages. The next day, they were joined on the streets by workers and students carrying placards that read, Down with the Tsar. Troops ordered to put down the disorder mutinied and joined the protesters instead. Hey. Tsarist officials were arrested. Prisons and police stations were attacked. That's the moment where you gotta be, if, if you're the not for the revolution, you know, for the czars, where you're just like, oh, crap, this isn't good. Like, when they revolt against you and join the uh, revolution. Officials were arrested. Prisons and police stations were attacked. Emblems of czarist rule smashed and burned. The government had lost control of the capital. The Tsar was told by his ministers that order could only be restored and Russia saved from military defeat if he gave up power. So on the 2nd of March, Nicholas agreed to abdicate. In just 10 days, 300 years of Romanov rule had come to an end. The February Revolution had been remarkably swift and bloodless, and hopes were now high for the creation of a more democratic, more just Russian state. Members of the State Duma, the National Assembly, had formed a provisional government, which was to hold power until a constituent assembly was elected. To give Russia the State Duma, the National Assembly had formed a provisional government, which was to hold power until a constituent assembly was elected to give Russia a new constitution. But in reality, the provisional government shared power with the Petrograd Soviet, a council elected by workers and soldiers that controlled the capital's troops, transport and communications. The Petrograd Soviet, dominated by the Socialist Revolutionary Party, and the Marxist Menshevik party was much more radical than the provisional government. Yet it supported the government's decision to continue the war and honor the committee. So I just want to like look at these faces for a second. Love to see video of uh, like old, even if it's obviously it's going to be old and grainy, but uh, like of these people talking. Supported the government's decision to continue the war and honor the commitments that Russia had made to the Allies. It was a fateful decision that ultimately played into the hands of Russia had made to decision to continue the war and honor the commitments that Russia had made to the Allies. It was a fateful decision that ultimately played into the hands of one of the smaller parties, the Bolsheviks. Their leader, Vladimir Lenin, recently returned from 16 years in exile. Uh, now that's a recognizable word, Bolsheviks. And Lenin, obviously. Their leader, Vladimir Lenin recently returned from 16 years in exile, bitterly opposed the imperialist war. 
He also demanded the immediate redistribution of land, from rich landowners to peasants, and the transfer of power from the bourgeois provisional government to the people's soviets or councils that... I just want to pause for a question, and sorry if it was talked about earlier and I missed it, but... Is there any animus towards the UK in, in any of this? Like, did... Maybe I should say this way. Was the Tsar at that point, since they were related to uh, other monarchs, seen as like a foreign rule over what should be Russians ruling Russians? I have no idea about that. I'm just kind of curious. It was springing up across Russia. The bulk of power from the bourgeois provisional government to the people's Soviets or councils that were springing up across Russia. The Bolshevik program was summed up in a simple slogan, bread, peace, and land. And as Russia's economic and military crisis deepened, it's- I mean, they're not, that's not like saying three things that isn't asking for much. I, I think that it's a pretty darn good slogan. It's like the three just essentially like, just give me bread, peace, and land. It's, I'm not saying therefore that the whole movement Listen, I'm an American, all right? <laughs> uh, leaving that out, obviously, just trying to pay attention to the history, but that slogan right there makes it look like you're definitely not the uh, bad guy. The appeal not to the, the masses guy. grew and grew. In June, a new Russian military offensive ended in disaster with 400,000 Russian casualties, massive desertions, and the collapse of army morale. A new Russian Sorry. military offensive ended in disaster with 400,000 Russian casualties, massive desertions, and the collapse of army morale and discipline. In July, soldiers and sailors in Petrograd mutinied. They were joined in the streets by workers with Bolshevik support. But troops loyal to the provisional government opened fire on the protesters and dispersed them. Loyal to the provisional government opened fire on the protesters and dispersed the crowds. A police crackdown followed, leading to the arrest of several Bolshevik leaders, including Leon Trotsky. While Lenin, with the help of Joseph Stalin, fled to Finland, traveling with forged papers under the name of Konstantin Ivanov. With, while Lenin, with the help of Joseph Stalin, fled to Finland. I was always really interested in... Nowadays, Lenin seems like much more of a light figure than Stalin. Um, in Russia, I, I, I could be wrong. Obviously, in America, they're not that popular. But, uh... My inner Dwight Eisenhower yelling out. Um, but I, I always wonder just what the... It, I, I wasn't really even sure if there was a relationship between these two guys. Obviously, I know very little. But um, I would like to know a little bit more about the history and background of, of Stalin, uh, Lenin especially, but Stalin too. While Lenin, with the help of Joseph Stalin fled to Finland, traveling with forged papers under the name of Konstantin Ivanov. A socialist and stirring orator named Alexander Kerensky became Russia's new prime minister and was hailed as the man who would save Russia from anarchy. Hang the German supporters and spies with Lenin at their head and disperse the Soviet? I, I don't, am I, with Lenin at their head? I get it, you know, hang German soldiers and spies. I just don't get how, never, sorry.
The army's commander-in-chief, General Kornilov, believed Russia's war effort was being undermined by chaos at home and deliberately sabotaged by men like Lenin, whom he declared a German spy. Oh, whoa, whoa. But Russia's war effort was being undermined. In chief, General Kornilov believed Russia's war effort was being undermined by chaos at home and deliberately sabotaged by men like Lenin, whom he declared a German spy. So in August, he ordered his men to march on Petrograd to restore order. Bolsheviks. I love the noise when it switches the ding. God, ADD. Petrograd to restore order. Bolsheviks played a leading role in the city's defense against this attempted military coup. Their most brilliant organizer, Leon Trotsky, was released from prison and sent armed Bolshevik militias, the Red Guards, to defend key points in the city. Strikes by railway workers, many of them Bolshevik supporters, prevented Kornilov from moving his men by rail. And his soldiers began to switch sides or simply go home. Supporters prevented Kornilov by railway workers, many of them Bolshevik supporters, prevented Kornilov from moving his men by rail. And his soldiers began to switch sides or simply go home. The Kornilov affair cast the Bolsheviks as saviors of the revolution. And by the end God, of the I gotta Bolsheviks, shut up. The Kornilov affair cast the Bolsheviks as saviors of the revolution. And by the end of September, they'd gained a majority in the Petrograd Soviet. In October, Lenin decided the time had come. He secretly returned from Finland to hmm. Petrograd and began preparing to seize power. It would be naive to wait for a formal majority for the Bolsheviks. No revolution ever waits for that. History will not forgive us if we do not assume power now. I... I have a lot to say about that, but I... How do you know that you're right? What if, what if... I mean, anyone could say that, right? I mean, no, it's not. I, I want to learn here, not... On the 25th of October, the Bolsheviks made their move. Red Guards and loyal troops seized key points around the capital. And that night, they stormed the provisional government's headquarters at the Winter Palace. An event later immortalized by Bolshevik propaganda and the great Soviet filmmaker, Sergei Eisenstein. That's a cool picture, though. And the great Soviet fil filmmaker, Sergei Eisenstein. Kerensky fled the city at the last moment, narrowly avoiding capture. And the next day, at the Second All-Russian Congress of Soviets, Lenin announced the overthrow of the provisional government. Ooh, this is intense. If we are not ready to shoot a saboteur and a white guard... What sort of revolution is that? Nothing but talk and a bowl of and a bowl, a bowl and a bowl of mush. Um, this guy has got moxie for sure. He's uh, got ambition and um, is aggressive. Um, I I think that the problem with the talk of revolution, all right, you know, there's American Revolution, all these revolutions. You could say, well, what if you know you could you could replace it with like. If you're not ready to shoot like um, a saboteur or a, a red coat, what sort of revolution is that? Nothing but a bull and bush and like insert some American. And that puts me in a perspective where it, it, it's true. And it, it, it's, it's, 
it's it leads to a lot of um things that have to happen but at the same time if you have a really bad person it's just sub subjective i guess um interesting i don't really know what i have to say about that to be honest The following months saw the Bolsheviks consolidate their hold on power, while fighting a brutal civil war against counter-revolutionary, or white Russian, forces who had foreign support. Some whites hoped to put Tsar Nicholas back on the throne. After his abdication, Nicholas and his family had been held under guard at Tsarkoye Selo, outside Petrograd, where they occupied themselves with gardening and other diversions. In summer 1917, the family was sent to Tobolsk in Siberia, where they lived under house arrest in the governor's mansion. The following spring, the Bolsheviks had the family moved to Yekaterinburg. In July 1918, as white forces approached the city, Bolshevik soldiers gathered the whole family in a cellar. The Tsar, his wife, their son Alexei, their four daughters, Olga, Tatiana, Maria, and Anastasia, as well as four servants, and executed them all. Russia's civil war was one of the 20th century's most devastating events. An estimated two million. It's so hard to comment on something like this because, again, from our time, it, it's hard to put yourself. I'm not obviously. It's not a. Do I really have to say it? It's not okay to shoot a whole family, women and children, and everything. Obviously, but from the point of the revolutionaries, it, it was a necessary uh, thing to do if they were ever going to be free of all this serfdom and and. Um, foreign influence, and so it's so difficult to comment on something like this, you know? Russia's civil war was one of the 20th century's most devastating events. An estimated two million soldiers lost their lives, while a typhus epidemic and famine claimed the lives of a further nine million civilians. By the end of 1921, the Bolsheviks had emerged victorious and under Lenin's determined and uncompromising leadership, set about building a new socialist order. The Soviet Union, created in 1922, emerged as a world superpower following the defeat of Nazi Germany in World War II. But it would always remain a single party state where all opposition or dissent was ruthlessly suppressed. So that's Marx, Lenin, and is that like Engels? Those brief hopes for Russian democracy that flowered amid the euphoria of the February Revolution were extinguished by the Bolshevik October Revolution and put beyond reach for decades to come. Bridgman images are the leading awesome video really awesome video epic history tv always a great video um love learning about you know some uh obviously you know parts of different nations history in general but a lot of the more calamitous influential um pivotal parts especially awesome to um to learn about and uh, see great videos like this um, I, I always want to say, uh, you know, I get a lot of international viewers. Um, from my point, a lot of, you know, American reacting to, or I always know that if I ever kind of show any kind of judgment or, or criticism or whatnot, I know that I, in a house of glass, it, you shouldn't throw stones and all that stuff. And I try not to, I try to just learn. And so if I came across as, uh something like that then that's my fault and uh, i always just want to learn about history and uh, we can always have discussions about other things um some other time join the discord guys that was a great video great cap off to the uh, russian uh, history one obviously i did not touch on everything it's hard to 
uh, with Russian history, I'm sure. But uh, that was awesome. Another great experience. I hope you guys had fun, learned a lot on this uh, journey with me again. And back to the other videos, Caesar 1, and I'm going to have to pick another series to start uh, reacting to. So I uh, hope you guys are doing well. See you guys next time. Supplier of